Good morning, my name's Janelle. I'm assuming that John Newton's introduced me and told you that we're videotaping today because I can't be with you for personal reasons. I'm really sorry that I won't be there for the discussion and your insights, but what I'll try and do is answer, after the presentation, I'll try and answer a couple of questions that John's given me. Today I'd like to tell you the story of one small community and its journey of recovery following the 2009 Black Saturday bushfires. It's the story of what we did, and in fact is still doing to this day, and something of how I think we did it. It's a very personal story. Clonbanane is a small pastoral community in north central Victoria, located about 80 kilometres north of Melbourne. Geographically, it lies east of the Hume Freeway and at the northern foot of Mount Disappointment. The original township of Clonbanane <coughs> excuse me, was established on the back of pastoral and gold mining endeavours, but now lacks a distinctive township precinct. The 2016 census reported a population of 523. By way of background, ahead of Black Saturday, we'd experienced 12 years of unrelenting drought, each year worse than the one before diminishing rainfall, crippling water restrictions and talk of worse to come, and fear, always triggered by, the, triggered by the local fire siren. Days spent watching the CFA website, checking to see which direction the fire trucks went as they drove past our place, and praying, please don't let it be the mountain. Living at the foot of Mount Disappointment means living with fear of fire every summer. And just when you thought it couldn't get any worse, that dreadful week of high 40 degree days, unrelenting heat and an increasing sense of unease as everything around us became tinder dry. On the day before the fires, we recorded a temperature of 47.6 degrees at home. It was so hot the white cockatoos were falling dead out of the trees. Saturday the 7th of February arrives. Low humidity, rapidly rising temperature and a punishing north wind. We initiated our fire plan. At about 11.50am the fire siren went off. The starting point of the Kilmore East fire was Saunders Road about two kilometres away from us. From her back veranda we watched the billowing smoke as the fire raced through a pine plantation on the outskirts of Clonbanane on its way to Wandong. As we watched the smoke plume grew and grew <clears throat> looking like a nuclear blast. At about 1pm, the ABC emergency radio told us that the fire had hit Wandong, about 8 kilometres to the south of us. We knew that if the southwesterly change predicted for later that afternoon came through, the fire would turn back on us and we'd be in trouble. We ramped up our fire plan and we waited. And the siren went on and on and on. It was both comforting and chilling. By mid-afternoon, Mount Disappointment was fully involved in fire and as we all know now, the fire moved quickly onto Strathewan, King Lake, King Lake West and many other communities with devastating consequences. The predicted change came through Clonbanane at about 6pm and as a consequence, we lost dozens of homes, sheds and farm buildings, innumerable, innumerable stock and miles of fencing. The sound of my neighbour shooting his injured cattle in the early evenings on the days after the fires stays with me to this day. Clonbanane's losses weren't on nearly the same scale of many of the other townships impacted that day, but in such a small community it nonetheless felt overwhelming. The local relief effort started within 24 hours, just as soon as it was possible to move around the local roads. The recovery process started maybe four weeks later and was initiated by Mitchell Shire when it called for community volunteers to participate in local community recovery and advisory committees. The Clonbanane Community Advisory Committee grew out of that request and was at the heart of the recovery process in Clonbanane for the next five years. That's not to say that lots of other individuals and groups didn't also assist with recovery activities because they did but this story is about the long haul. Initially, the advisory committee was a ragtag sort of affair made up of self-selected participants and with no real structure and processes. Its primary task was to advise council 
on what the local recovery needs were and to devise and run programs and activities to assist local people in their recovery. Over the next couple of years we, went, we ran youth art programs, men's welding programs and woodworking programs where they made bookshelves and gave them, along with donated books, to people who'd lost everything. We planted trees to improve the park, rebuilt fences and started a local newsletter to let people know what was going on, what services were available and where to get advice. We ran first of the many community events including community dinners, family fun days and a movie night. We advocated for the community and continued to provide advice on recovery matters. We learned too to work as a group and became more sophisticated in our operations. Alongside these activities, another critical task during the first two years after the fires was to act as the project control group for the, re for the building of a new community hall. Until the fires, the only public assets in Clonbernane had been the fire station and the local park. Within a day it became obvious that you couldn't run relief and recovery activities from a working fire station. As we worked together, people started saying, we need a hall. At the same time, some of us were also starting to wonder if there wasn't an opportunity for us in all the millions of dollars coming into the Bushfire Appeal Fund. We started work with Mitchell Shire to put together a proposal for funds and lo and behold got a million dollars to build a hall that hadn't existed before the fires. I still think that was a bit cheeky but there you go. Around the time of the fifth anniversary of the fires, I recall quite clearly leading a conversation in the advisory committee about it maybe being time for us to reconsider our role. While we recognised that many individuals and families were still trying to recover from the impact of the fires, maybe it was time for us to think about our future task. In 2014 we held a planning workshop and agreed that while still supporting recovery where we could, and in addition to managing the hall, our primary focus would now be on advocacy and building capacity and resilience in the community. At that time we became the Clonbanane Community Action Group which is now an incorporated association and since then have raised close to $100,000 through grants, all of which goes back into the community. Among other, among other things, we've used that money to continue to run community events like dinners, short certificate courses, school holiday activities, community markets, arts activities, improving the amenity of the hall by installing equipment such as a projector, sound equipment, Wi-Fi and blinds, etc. We now have a Facebook page, which I have to say is very popular with the locals with regard to lost dogs, and we've facilitated the establishment of a number of groups, including playgroup, yoga and open mic, which is a monthly jam session for local musicians. The decision to focus on building community resilience led us down the preparedness pathway. While Patel et al. found no evidence of an agreed definition of community resilience, for our purposes, we define community resilience as the sustained ability of a community to use available resources to respond to, withstand and recover from adverse situations. While the idea of community resilience has come to the fore recently in the context of recovering from disasters such as floods and fires, for us it also means psychological shock. We recently found ourselves in a situation where we had to deal with the shockwaves associated with the discovery that the man who had murdered Carly Mabry in 1984 had been hiding in our community for nearly 30 years. Patel et al. report that preparedness is a key element of community resilience. Those of us who are in Clonbanane on Black Saturday never want to experience another day like it. As a community, we want to be safe and well, connected, inclusive and empowered, culturally rich and vibrant, democratic, engaged, reflective and aware, all identified as resilience characteristics in the Emergency Management Victoria Community Resilience Framework. I think we do this by reference to what Patel et al. refer to as nine core elements of community resilience local knowledge, community networks and relationships, communication, health, governance and leadership, 
resources, economic investment, preparedness and mental outlook. I have to admit that as a small community committee we are unlikely to be able to directly influence some of these elements, for example health and economic investment. But we do have the local knowledge and have been working for some years on community networks and relationships, communication, governance and leadership, resources and mental outlook. That leaves preparedness. Our efforts towards preparedness so far have included the development and publication of the Clonbernane Neighbourhood Emergency Plan, which provides practical advice for preparing for, during and after an emergency. We've just in fact published the second edition of this plan. We also obtained grant funds to the value of $27,000 to purchase and install the biggest generator I've ever seen at the hall to be used in the event that we lose power during an emergency or on extreme heat days. We've also just received grant funds to asphalt the driveway and car park at the hall, which is linked to the idea that the hall will be used as our emergency hub if necessary. Finally, we're working with the CFA, Mitchell Shire and DELP on a community-based bushfire management project. We were invited to participate in this project because of our high fire risk and because our committee was recognised as existing infrastructure that could support the project. We always try to involve as many community members as possible in all of our projects. For example, when we developed our neighbourhood emergency plan, we identified 12 key community members that had expert or critical knowledge that could inform the plan and we went and interviewed each of them. The purchase of the generator came out of that interview process when we asked people what sort of things can we do to make ourselves safer. The community-based bushfire management project will involve conducting a Clonbernane bushfire scenario scheduled for next month to hopefully generate enough interest to establish a small project group who will be tasked with coming up with ideas of practical things that can be done to reduce our bushfire risk. Things like targeted burning, better communication channels, etc. Finally, the Facebook page has moved on from lost dogs, upcoming events and sunset photos. Now we also use it to let people know about things like serious weather events, power outages, rescue operations, etc. So how have we reached, how have we achieved what we've done? As I said earlier, when we first got together, we were a ragtag sort of bunch, a group of practical people with a diverse set of skills. I sometimes find myself wondering, it is, wondering how it is we've achieved so much and continue to work together so successfully for nearly 10 years. <clears throat> and I think that, that while this is a very simple analysis, our success can be explained by some of the fundamental tenets of the system psychodynamics theory. The first, I think, is the importance of the task to each of us. It is the simplest form. In its simplest form, the idea of primary task is that which an organisation must undertake to be what it says it is. Chapman extends the work of Rice and others by defining the primary task of an organisation as that one thing the system needs to do in order to survive as itself. Be unheld that every group needs to do something that is, carry out a task. Understanding how a group, organisation or system carries out its task, how it feels about the task and how it organises itself into carrying out its task is key to understanding organisations and as such is a critical concept in the theory and pra practice of system psychodynamics. Because a group or organisation comes together primarily to carry out a task, the idea of task is intrinsic to the definition of any group. Long is of the view that the dynamics of task are best understood by focusing on how role holders carry out and experience their tasks in the wider work system. Task starts as an idea about what might be done and then the doing of it becomes a realisation. Tasks can be conscious or unconscious, can be experienced as present or absent, can be loved or hated, can be rewarding or persecutory, and the carrying out of tasks may in themselves provoke anxiety in the role holder or the whole task system. Tasks change over time and may need to be renegotiated. 
Discovering the value of the task, says Long, comes through a careful process of engaging with the task and encountering the meanings it has held over the years. It is only by close examination of our doing, taking and feeling a task can we understand its value. In summary, the idea and realisation of task is fundamental to an organisation's survival. Understanding how a system organises itself around the carrying out of its primary and associated tasks is a useful strategy for understanding organisation dynamics. Task is best understood by studying how an organisation engages with, the tasks, with its task, how it is experienced and what it has come to mean. Our task has evolved over time and how we go ab about our business has become more, much more sophisticated but the underlying value of our task has always remained the same. For, for each of us the task is simple and yet compelling. We all want to make the Clonbanan community as safe as possible and strong enough to reco recover quickly in the event of another disaster. And every time the fire siren sounds, there's a serious car accident, a damaging storm or Sunday Creek floods, we were reminded about how important our task is to us. <clears throat> the sec second factor is that of role. Role is a significant concept within system psych psychodynamics and is closely linked to the idea of task. In an organisational context, it is the role holder who in, whose endeavours are directed towards realisation of the task. Reason, Reed and Bazelgette define role as a mental regulating principle based on a person's lived experience of the complex interaction of feelings, ideas and motivations aroused in working to the aim of a system, integrated consciously and unconsciously and expressed in purposive behaviour. Role is that dynamic place where the individual and the system intersect. Reed and Bazelgette suggest that to understand the idea of role in the workplace, one must think about it from the perspective of the person, the system and the context within which the role is located. They explain this in terms of the psychological, the sociological and the contextual aspects of role. The psychological aspects of role come about as the role holder constructs a set of behavioural patterns so that the person can act on the situation to, to achieve a desired goal. The sociological aspects, on the other hand, are expressed as the expectation of the person in role by the other role holders in the system, the boss, the colleagues, the customers, for example. The contextual aspects include the environmental, sorry, the internal environment and the external, political, social and economic conditions. Reed, Reed and Basil suggest that the sociological and contextual elements influence the way the person defines the role, but that ultimately it is the person who finds, makes and takes the role. Each of us in the committee has found, made and taken up a role, or in some instances multiple roles. Some of these roles are formal and necessary as a requirement for incorporation like the President, Secretary and Treasurer. Others are less formal but more important in terms of us getting the work done. We have the fixer handyman who can fix just about anything. The writer who writes all of the correspondence, grant applications and the newsletter. The party organiser who organises all of the school holidays activities, school holiday activities. The printer designer who arranges all of our printing and designs flyers and posters and the event facilitator who takes up and organises all sorts of wild and crazy events and finally the leader manager who tries to hold it all together. The management of boundaries is another key factor in understanding how we work and the role of leader manager, manager is important in the context of boundaries. It is critical that leaders and managers of organisations maintain the boundaries of their groups and organisations, thus ensuring the integrity and standards of effectiveness and efficiency of the group. Boundary maintenance, maintenance is a difficult task. Boundaries can be filled with anxiety and defensive responses elicited by the potential for boundary crossing from the resultant efforts to work with other parts of the system through integration or collaboration. 
Effective leaders and managers spend increasing amounts of their time working at the boundary, representing their organisations and negotiating with other parts of the system. Xander believes that boundaries between all systems offer opportunities for either collaboration or conflict. Managing the boundaries in our context has been challenging at times over the years. One example of this was when we first started the recovery process. Our relationship with Mitchell Shire was good. The community development people working for the Shire were local people very much involved in the recovery process and they worked well with community groups. They understood the pain people were struggling with, were consultative and worked hard to minim minimise administrative barriers. Unfortunately, after a couple of years, some of these key people moved on. This corresponded with Mitchell Shire going through a significant period of turbulence and associated high staff turnover in which all of the organisational history was lost. All previous agreements had to be re-prosecuted and this was seriously compounded by the fact that the new council officers had little or no experience of the fires, no understanding of the impact they had had on people and were not at all consultative. They just swooped in and started telling us what they were going to do for us, or was that to us? This was a very difficult time. It's true to say that for a few years our boundaries became filled with anxiety and defensive responses elicited by potential boundary crossing, and it felt like we were at war with Mitchell Shire. As you might expect, we dug our heels in and were engaged in many battles with the Shire during that time. I'm pleased to report for the record that our relationships with Mitchell Shire have improved significantly over the last couple of years since the employment of a new CEO at Mitchell and a much more settled staffing profile. The idea of containment was critical during that time. Beyond has been attributed with the development of the concept of containment which has a central role, central place in the theory and practice of system psychodynamics. Beyond originally used it in the context of individual psychotherapy, but later extended it to groups and organisations. Hoggett and Tom Thompson attribute Beyond as using the idea of a mother comforting a distressed child as a metaphor to describe the relationship between the container and what is being contained. Hoggett and Thompson point out that containment allows for the transformation of emotion, not its expression. Once adequately contained, the energy derived from the transformed emotions can be used for socially constructive purposes in a safe way. The concepts of container and contained go hand in hand and relate to what is contained within the container. Effective containment is about holding the group and the emotions are anxiety within the group and through repeated experiences of safety and support the group learns to transform its emotions into constructive energy for creativity. My sense during our struggles with Mitchell Shire is that containment worked in exactly the same way it was described by Hoggett and Thompson. During lots of committee meetings, an agenda item relating to the Shire would surface all, surface all of our anger and frustration about the Shire. Thankfully, the containment was good enough in Wincottian terms and safe enough to allow us to express our anger and frustration, work through it in some way, and then come, with, come up with a strategy to progress the matter further. Being able to express our feelings of anger and frustration reduced the risk, the risk that these feelings would unconsciously subvert our task. Over the long haul, our container or our safe spaces worked well for us. Even during the most turbulent of times, we have been able to hold our place in the system, never lose sight of our task, grow as individuals and as, a, as individuals and a group, and as Hoggett and Thompson suggest, learn to transform our emotions, emotions into constructive energy for creativity. In conclusion, I think the fundamental system psychodynamic concepts of task, role, boundaries and containment go some way towards explaining why we've achieved what we have and how we've worked together successfully for nearly 10 years. Somehow they're the glue that hold us together or the oil that helps the wheels turn. I don't know what the right metaphor is, but somehow it works for us and largely unconsciously. 
the group is not at all reflective. We're only inclined to work on the, in the business, not on the business. So it just happens. Every community impacted by the Black Saturday fires has its own story of recovery. These stories are different and yet the same. How they differ is determined by scale, the extent of the losses, both human and built, and the ferocity of the fires as they came through. How, they are, how they're the same is in terms of the emotional and physical impacts, the bravery and sometimes desperation of people, the coming together of communities and the lessons learned. I really only know the Clombinane story, but as one of growth out of recovery and taking its future in hand through preparedness. Thank you. I'm expecting that John's told that he read the paper uh, a couple of days before you're seeing this video. And what that did was um, provoke a number of questions about things that he was curious, with, curious about. So what I'm going to try and do now is ask the questions on his behalf and then provide the answers. <clears throat> so the first question is, you write that living at the foot of Mount Disappointment means living with fear of fire every summer. Was the community unprepared in 2009 despite this re recurring fear? What is the dynamic of fear in this community? Does it motivate some and not others? Does it get ex repressed or dis denied? Could it be usefully amplified? We, as a community, I think we weren't well prepared. We'd done, uh, certainly not as a community. Individuals were prepared. Uh, the fire brigade was prepared, but I don't think anybody could have been prepared for what actually came through that day. I know from, from my personal point of view, we'd done everything that we could and we'd been talking, talking to people, we'd had the fire brigade come through and give us advice about what we needed to do. And I know that did, did that for lots of people, but certainly as a whole community, we weren't prepared. And I think people were living a bit in um, denial despite the fact that the government had warned people about the seriousness of the fire season, um, I, I guess at some level people just deny it. On the morning of the fires, I know lots of people went out and um, just went about their normal Saturday morning business and then found that they couldn't get back in because the highway was closed and they were desperate. We stayed um, and I think in the end that was the right decision to do at the time, but in, in retrospect I'm, I'm not so sure that I'd stay again knowing what we were facing. What's the dynamic of fear in this community? I'm not sure I, I really know. I do know that the fire siren used to make people nervous and now it really makes people nervous. But it doesn't, it doesn't motivate people enough in and of itself to um, do a lot. People, I think, deny it. Others, some are well motivated. They probably would always have been motivated. Others, not so. Does it get repressed or denied? Could it be usefully amplified? I, I think I think um, we have been trying to amplify it a bit, and I'll come back to this in the context of one of one of other one of John's other questions. But I think it's it's at some level it is helpful to amplify it because it just reminds people to some extent about um, what the potential could be. There's been a number of new people moved into the community they didn't experience the fires and so they don't, they don't remember and so we need some way to let them know in a, in a very visceral sense about what the potential for fire is. One of John's other questions is about the Community Advisory Committee. You describe the membership as self-selected and ragtag initially gra and gradually becoming more sophisticated. Would you regard this as a natural progression or was the development prompted by internal or external triggers? Um, I think initially it was prompted by the fact that we were part of the 
advisory committee. There was quite a lot of money around, as I said. One of our roles was to um, not only advise Mitchell about what the re local recovery needs were, but also to devise and run programs. And so we had to s fairly quickly, I think, get some structures in place to allow us to be able to do that, to be able to think together, to be able to consult the community, to listen to what people were saying, to be able to um, work together to put some sort of program together, a youth art program or woodworking program or whatever it was. And so um, those external triggers actually prompted our um, need to become more sophisticated in the way we worked. Um, there's another question here. It seems that the committee went from a focus on reaction and relief actions to thinking ahead and getting grants for new infrastructure. What sort of leadership and collaboration emerged in the committee? Was it shaped by the need for formal roles or was it more a case of distributed leadership? Um, the sort of leadership I think is, I'm the president of the committee and I guess to a very large extent I've taken up the leadership role. Um, that comes, I guess, from my experience of working in those sorts of places for, for many years and um, from, from a realisation that nobody else in the group was going to be able to take that up. The sort of leadership I, style I guess I adopt in the committee is, is a sort of a gentle prodding. The ideas are there. It's about trying to get people to sit down and work through what the issues are and, and bring forward their own ideas about what we, might be do, what we might be doing in a particular set of circumstances. The, the group, in fact, is, is collaborative within itself and with the wider social system that we, we work in. I've discovered over time that because we've got such a wide set of skills that we can draw on, um, People are very generous with their time and they, they are very happy to work together. And so we, we do some really good work, I think, because, um, because the dynamics of the group are such and the generosity within the group is such that people will always give their time. And if they, if they don't know how to do something or don't have a skill set um, within the group, they always know somebody local who does and so we go and prevail upon them to give their time or their advice or their knowledge or their equipment, whatever it might be. Another question is, what is the community role of Clonbanane and how relevant is this to forming of resilience and preparedness? Uh, the Clonbanane community is made up of um, Two key subgroups, I guess, maybe three. Um, it's geographically diverse and that geographical diversity to some extent determines the makeup of the community that live within them. So we've got a, a big um, area which I refer to as the Clomodan Valley, which is farmland and it's owned by people with um, working farms or hobby farms. Um, there's another area, Doctors Creek Road, which is made up of a, a very diverse group of people, some of whom uh, you might describe as uh, aged hippies, others are reclusive, they live on small acreage, um, some of them go out to work, some of them work from home. Um, it's, it's a very distinct subgroup. And then there's, then there's the uh, housing estate, which is like a little village, if you like, in the middle of Clondonane called Waterford Park. There's 93 houses there, I think, and um, it's, it's largely made up of people who've moved up from the suburbs, sometimes as long as 30 or more years ago, um, who live on uh, in conventional housing blocks who generally work away um, or our stay-at-home mums, elderly people, a whole range of people, but it's more like a, a you know, a sort of suburban um, 
area. And so those three groups of people uh, cross over, but at some extent are quite separate as well. How does that influence our capacity to work on preparedness? I think the Clumbernane Valley people are closer to Mount Disappointment, Mount Disappointment closer to the forest itself and are very aware of the, the risk of fire. I think the same goes for uh, the Doctors Creek Road people. They live in uh, another, uh, you know, a separate area but also close to the forest and in fact some of them live in the forest. And they're also very aware of the risk and the need to be prepared. The Waterford Park people less so. Because they, uh, they live in what's effectively a, a, a suburb, um, I think the risk of fire is not so potent for them. You know, that's not exclusively true, but um, I think largely they aren't so readily involved in the preparedness activities and I think sometimes they wonder what we're doing. Do you think governance and leadership in a community setting differs from a corporate setting? If so, in what way and does it require different capacities? I, I think on some level leadership's the same really no matter where it's being played out, but I think in the community, community setting it's, it's also a bit different for some reasons. You need, to be, you need to be very aware of the fact that you in fact live with these people. You, you um, see them every day when you're walking the dog, when you're bringing in the rubbish bins, when they drive past your house. You need always at some level to be available in a way that I think um, in a corporate setting doesn't necessarily apply. I mean, you know, at some extent, to some extent in the corporate setting, you can go home at the end of the day. In the community, community setting, that's certainly not the same. Things happen in the middle of the night, things happen in the early hours of the morning, and you need to be available all of the time. I think the other thing that's different is that you don't have the same authority that comes out of role in, uh, in a corporate setting in the community. You need to be able to think about how you can influence people in a, in a different way. Just by really talking to people, by listening to people, and by thinking about how everything that you're hearing somehow fits together and leads you down a path to try and influence people uh, to think about the things that they've actually identified as important but not necessarily always realised it for themselves. Another question is regard, it relates to the community-based bushfire management project where I've said that it'll hopefully generate enough interest. Um, John was taken by the word hopefully now, nine years on, with the annual fear to would the annual fear be enough to catalyse sufficient sustained preparedness? I'm wondering what is the connection between memory and preparedness? I think for us um, there is a very clear connection. The, the fire sirens are the perfect example. For those of us that were there on the day, we, at some level, relive that morning whenever we hear the fire siren. And so it reminds us that we need to think about our fire plan. We need to think about, you know, whether we've cleaned the gutters out. We need to think about whether we're prepared. And I think on a community level, it has the same sort of impact uh, for lots of people, not, not everybody. Um, certainly when uh, there's an increased level of activity on the Facebook page when the siren goes off and I'm sure it's because people are remembering. The phone rings more, there's just a, a heightened awareness of the fact that 
this could happen again and that we need to be prepared this time. We need to be better prepared this time. We need to be better prepared as a community this time so that our efforts are much more focused and much more strategic and not so sort of spontaneous as they were in the early days of, after the, the bushfires. And we need to remind ourselves that we're much more powerful now. We can do things which will help us prepare that we weren't able, as a community, that we weren't able to do as individuals in 2009. The connection between memory and preparedness. Do you have to keep memory alive, painful as it is to sustain mental preparedness? Is there a place for memorialisation? Um, yes, I think there is. I mean, I think I think we do try to keep the memory alive. Um, we do it through the newsletter. I know the CFA does it. Each year they hold a um, fire safety awareness event of some sort um, ahead of the fires. Um, the 10th anniversary is coming up in February next year and we've just, um, we've just applied for funds to run an event that, that night. Um, and it'll be not only about um, remembering, it'll, it'll not only be about focusing on how far we've come as a community since 2009, but it'll also be about remembering. I, I think we're facing a very serious fire danger period this year and um, it'll be very timely to remind people that while we never want it to happen again, it could. Okay, so this is the final question. In your discussion of holding and containing, I was surprised that you didn't mention the new community hall. To my mind, it's the perfect example of a physical holding for the community, a secure base that did not previously exist, and perhaps also a potential memorial which could help overcome any tendency for forgetting. John's right, of course, the hall is the perfect holding environment for the community. <coughs> it's where we hold all our events. It's where we tell our stories about the fires whenever anybody new comes in because the, the youth program artwork is on display there. It's, it's been permanently built into the infrastructure of the hall. Um, the metalwork that um, some of the kids did up at the Seymour Forge in the months after the fires is also there. They made some of the most magnificent um, metalwork seats and they've all been installed around the door and so we and people always comment on them they um, and we we tell a, we tell the story of, of how they came about and it reminds people I'm sure it's a potent reminder for everybody who walks into the hall too because they're so clearly related to the bushfires I think the reason why I didn't think so much about, about the hall as a holding environment was because I'd been recently dealing with Mitchell Shire and, and I was sort of, we'd been talking, they'd asked me, they were new people and they'd asked me what the relationship with the Shire was like and so I'd been thinking back over how difficult it had been and how much it had improved in the last couple of years. And so that was in the forefront of my mind. I know when we were building the hall we had this fantasy that if we built it, people would come, that it would be a place for people to come and be together and um, build the sort of relationships and connections, social connections that, that are underpin, that underpin, resili that underpin resilience. But I also know I had a few sleepless nights wondering about whether in fact our fantasy would ever come out, come to fruition and in, and in fact it has. So the hall is very special to us. It is a place, the, the bushfire memorial um, is actually on the hall site. Um, people, it's a very tactile piece of artwork that people go and touch and um, reconnect, I guess, with their experiences at the time, certainly for those of us that were there. 
and I hope new people also um, just you know people who are new to the community absorb it and actually um, are just aware of the fact that they do need to be prepared. I think that's the last question. I'm really sorry that I won't be there for the discussion. I'm really hoping that um, I'll get some feedback from John about the sorts of issues that you raised. Thank you very much. Thank you.